Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the latest edition of Humans at Work, HDO's webinar series. My name is Lewis Miller, and I'm the Assistant Director of HDO. Today, we are joined by Dr. Jeremy Surrey, a professor in UT's Department of History and the LBJ School of Public Affairs. He also serves as the Academic Director for the Executive Master in Public Leadership Program at the LBJ School and teaches in HGO's professional training programs. Dr. Surrey is here to discuss new social science research that diagnoses challenges faced in positions of leadership. He will also introduce new ways of thinking about leadership for a new era and help you develop more strategic, visionary, and efficient approaches to leadership. A few notes before we get started. Please mute your microphone and turn off your video during Dr. Surrey's presentation. If you have any pressing issues or questions during the session, feel free to send any HDO staff member a private chat. We're listed as name at HDO in the list of participants. At the conclusion of the presentation, there'll be approximately 15 minutes for Q&A. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Suri. I hope you enjoyed the session. Well, welcome everyone. This is uh, Jeremy Suri. I'm sorry I can't see you all. I actually put a tie on today thinking I would, and, and, and now I'm feeling silly that I'm standing here uh, with a tie staring at a screen. Uh, but I'm delighted uh, that we have an opportunity to talk about leadership. Um, I think if there's one thing we can all agree on, in fact, all Americans can agree on, uh, we face a crisis of leadership in our society today. And that doesn't just apply to our politics, it applies to all kinds of institutions. And my research, my writing, my uh, political activism, my teaching is all about trying to help us to become better leaders. Uh, there are no easy answers. There is no formula for being a great leader. Leadership is context specific and it changes over time. Uh, what I would like to do in this uh, relatively short presentation and then discussion, and I hope we will have a discussion, uh, so please do send your questions in and I'll try to get to all of them and please also feel free to follow up with me by email. Uh, what I'll try to do today is to introduce some research concepts. I will not have uh, the time obviously to go into them in great depth or even to talk about how they could all be applied most fully in the different kinds of leadership work that all of you do. Uh, but I do think these research concepts are really important. They grow out of work that I've done and many other scholars have done studying leaders, um, studying leaders in other times to try to extract lessons that we can use for our own time today. Uh, and that's what I mean by the essentials of effective leadership. Again, these are not formulas. These are provocations. These are ways of thinking. These are starting points for becoming better leaders in our own world. I spend much of my time talking to leaders around the country and around the world, young leaders and older leaders as well. And I think uh, this moment of crisis is also a moment of possibility. Uh, we have the opportunity because we see that our leaders at many levels are not performing to the levels they should be. We have the opportunity to draw on new ideas and draw on the past to make ourselves into better leaders for the future. We study the past not to become the old men of the past. We study the past to become better young leaders today. We use the wisdom of the past to adjust to a new world. We have to look back to think forward, look back to think forward. Um, a lot of the research I'll present today uh, grows out of uh, a book I recently published. I'm working on a new book as a follow-on to this about democratic renewals. Uh, but the book I published a year and a half ago or so, two years ago or so, uh, was on uh, why presidents would become more powerful over the last uh, 200 years, why power at a certain level has actually debilitated their ability to succeed in office how the power of presidencies and the challenges presidents face have made it harder for them to actually achieve the goals they themselves define. And, and the image uh, on the front of the book, which is one of the research focuses of the book, is on uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, and there he is feeling, I think, like all of us feel, probably by the end of the day on Tuesday each week, uh, overburdened, um, leaning over the desk, just hoping that somehow we can get through all the things in, in front of us. That, that's sort of, I think, where we all are and where we all end up as leaders at some point. The presidency is in some ways just an extended case study in what all of us confront. We study, those of us who do this kind of research, we study presidents not only because we're interested in presidents, but because they leave a documentary record that allows us to actually examine people's lives and understand where they do well and where they don't do well and draw lessons for that in our own lives as well. And, and many of the challenges presidents face are challenges we confront every day. Um, I love cartoons, and I love this cartoon. Um, 
whether you uh, work in a uh, public office or a private office, whether you are an elected official or you are reporting to a board, uh, whether you're a university president or a city council member or a governor uh, or a CEO, uh, you confront today a heavily partisan world. It's unavoidable. It is unavoidable. I think even if you were you know, living on an island, somehow you would feel the partisan pressures of our world today. They're not new. Uh, it's part of the point I'm making in the new book I'm working on. If anyone has any questions about that, I'm happy to talk about that. I don't want to, want to get into the history of partisanship right now. It's certainly not new. Uh, but it does seem to have reached uh, a concentrated, extended uh, part of our world today. Uh, and it makes everything hard. It makes everything hard because there's a ready opposition to anything we do. It makes everything hard because we feel like uh, we're under a magnifying glass. And any small mistake, uh, even if it's not a very consequential mistake, will be blown out of proportion and used by the other side. There's ill will waiting every moment, ho hovering around our doors to come in and jump all over us, write new stories about us, and condemn us. Uh, for what we do. And this is a real debilitating problem. I've done a lot of work talking to uh, all kinds of business and political leaders, and this is a point they make. Uh, they fear failure. They fear failure. Uh, it's a point I make about uh, presidents as well. Over time, it's become harder and harder, even for those with a lot of power, even for those with electoral mandates. Uh, it's become harder and harder for them to do big things, even though they campaign with big rhetoric, because uh, the fear of failure is so great. And it's very hard to overcome that. Partisanship is part of that. It divides us. It makes it hard for us to work together. It reduces the margin of error. It puts us in a hypercritical environment. Um, I work with a lot of uh, middle managers uh, in state and other public offices, and they feel this every day. Uh, they're sometimes even afraid to say anything uh, because anything they say can be uh, manipulated and misused against us. That, that's a real problem we confront today. It's always been there, but it has certainly gotten worse. Uh, we also have uh, this problem. Uh, this is the uh, distraction problem. Many of you might be feeling it right now because I can't see you. I can't tell whether you're also checking your email while you're listening to me. If you are, stop doing that. Uh, you will not listen. You will not get as much out of this experience. Uh, we all believe that we can multitask, or in fact, what a lot of the studies show is we believe everyone should listen to us when we speak with 100% attention, but we don't have to listen to others because we have too much on our plates and we think we're good enough to answer email, uh, eat our lunch, and read two things while someone is talking to us at the same time. Uh, and, and it's not because we're undisciplined, it's in fact because we are hyper-disciplined. That's what the research shows. We are so task-driven. We feel so pressured to get things done. We have lists in our minds telling us of more things to do than ever before that we are distracted and pulling ourselves in multiple directions. And three things come out very clearly. You've all experienced this. First, we don't actually fully think through what we're doing. This mode is a reactive mode. This is one of the key insights of my research on the presidency and also the work I've done with business leaders, which is that as they become more powerful in the last 20 years, with more resources at their command, they become more reactive. Think about American foreign policy in this way. We react to crises around the world. We don't lead, we react to crises. We're like um, the parent who's constantly reacting to the misbehavior rather than actually parenting the child uh, around us. So we become reactive. Second, um, we lose sight of the larger purposes in what we're doing. We become tactical and not strategic. One way of thinking about what many of us have fallen into is we've fallen into a promotion process where we get promoted by not making mistakes and promoted by doing a lot of little tasks that no one else could do. We're in the office earlier, we stay later, we get more shit done, and therefore uh, we get promoted and people say nice things about us, but all the little things we're doing might not actually add up to the big things that are most important in our job. Those things get kicked down the road. The big decisions we avoid, we do a lot of the small stuff. We're very good at doing the small stuff. So we're reactive, we emphasize the small stuff. And third, and probably most disconcerting of all, we wear ourselves out. We wear ourselves out. You've all had this experience of spending an entire afternoon answering email, and then your child asks you when you get home what you've done, and you cannot explain, but yet you are so tired. Uh, this is draining. Uh, it's a really important point. It's the biology of this world that we're in. We drain our energies 
rather than focusing. It is as if we are the fastball pitcher, but we spend all afternoon throwing knuckleballs and curveballs, and then when we want to throw our fastball, we don't have it left in us. We don't have it left in us as a consequence. We wear ourselves out. And in fact, the health emphasis on going to the gym and doing all that stuff is good. But again, what a lot of the research shows is that we add that as another task. So it actually isn't a relief. It becomes another task on the list of things to do, which further wears us out. We can see this graphically uh, in, in presidents themselves, and some of this uh, would be your world as well. This is uh, one case where I can actually show you the research, show you the archive, show you why it's awesome to be a historian, because we actually get to look at what people do. We don't just have to theorize. Um, so here in front of you, uh, and if, if you've seen my book, or you've maybe seen some of these calendars, I put them in the most recent book. Um, these are so much fun to find in the archives. Uh, this is uh, Franklin Roosevelt's calendar, the president of the United States, the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, all of you have busier calendars today. All of you have busier calendars on a Sunday than he had the day after. Uh, he's not goofing off, uh, but he's got a lot of time to think. He's got a lot of time to focus on the important things, to focus on that 1230 message to Congress, which is not just a speech. It's a way of laying out a vision for how the United States is going to react to this attack upon the United States to a fascist enemy that has taken over Europe and Asia, a country that's deeply isolationist and still in depression. Uh, we know what happened after World War II or during World War II. They, of course, did not at the time. Americans were deeply frightened. You think this is an uncertain world today. Americans were deeply concerned and they were deeply divided over what to do. Uh, one of the most popular radio personalities at the time was a man named Father Coughlin from Detroit. Uh, he had actually more listeners than Franklin Roosevelt, and his argument was that the fascists were the good guys because they were killing the Jews, who were the source of the depression in the United States, Father Coughlin argued. Hate speech, division, those are not unique to our own day. Franklin Roosevelt had to bring the country together. He had to articulate a vision, he had to give people a sense of comfort, a sense of confidence that they could move forward, and he had to not overpromise and underdeliver. Uh, he had the time and the space uh, to think about this, to work with his closest advisors to do the big stuff and not get caught in the little stuff. And, and just look at this calendar also. Um, it's 1941. Everything's written in. Missy Lehan, the president's secretary, can write things in as they come up. It's spontaneous. It's open. It's humane. This is a livable life. This is a livable life as a leader. Just 20 years later, the world has changed already. It's extraordinary to compare these two, isn't it? Just, just the orthography alone. This is the world of 1941. This is the world of 1962. Just 20 years later, ladies and gentlemen, this is President Kennedy's calendar. The day, and you can see this at 11.50 p.m., the day he's briefed on the missiles in Cuba. Isn't this cool? Um, I, I hope you're all nodding your heads, yes, because this, sort of, this stuff gets me really uh, excited. Um, uh, 11.50 p.m., uh, the president's briefed on the missiles in Cuba and the possibility of nuclear war. In fact, General Maxwell Taylor tells him there is a very high likelihood of military conflict with the uh, Soviet Union, and that could involve nuclear weapons. Uh, the president, though, has to leave to go entertain the crown prince of Libya, then has to do a press conference. He does not get back to this issue until 8 o'clock. So he's told 11.50 p.m., you know, the world might, 11.50 uh, a.m., excuse me, the world might explode. Uh, and, when they, and we're really on the edge of apocalypse. Oh, okay, but you go back to your lunch and then come back and tell us at 8 p.m. what you think uh, about this. Uh, this goes on for two weeks. The president has too much on his calendar. He's constantly coming into the meetings of his military advisors and diplomatic advisors after they've been meeting for a long time and already created fait accompli. And he has to spend most of his time pulling them back, uh, pulling them back from decisions he himself doesn't want to see made because he sees a broader vision for himself as president, which does not include going to war. In fact, he wants to avoid going to war. And he is, in fact, heroic in this. But it takes two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, President Kennedy says, we cannot do this again. Can't do this again, not simply because of the danger, but because he has worn himself out in this process. He has too much else on his plate. Franklin Roosevelt was able to focus on what really mattered, quite frankly, because he had fewer distractions. There were maybe five leaders in the world who mattered and one or two issues that dominated his life. Uh, just think about, when you look at Kennedy's calendar, how many more countries there are in the world, in a world post-empire, where the United States is competing for influence in 123 countries, there are four more people for him to meet with. That's why he's meeting with the Crown Prince of Libya. There's also a more active press, more programs at home, thanks to the New Deal that he's managing, more issues. He's in much more of a fishbowl. 
Here's Lyndon Johnson, uh, March of 1865, just three years after the Kennedy uh, calendars I showed you, and uh, 24 years, that's all, less than a quarter of a century after Pearl Harbor. This is one of eight pages for one day. This day, March 8th, 1965, is the day of the Selma March in Alabama, famous Voting Rights March. It gets us the Voting Rights Act, which just had uh, an important anniversary. We should remember the importance of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, it's also the first day American forces are sent into combat in Vietnam. It's also the day of a campaign contribution scandal involving Governor John Connolly of Texas. It's also uh, a day when President Johnson has to get into budget negotiations. Uh, he is using this new invention called the telephone, which is the predecessor to email in many ways. And if you go and listen to the conversations of Johnson on the phone at the LBJ Library, you'll hear that he, he just rolls from one issue to another, and he often forgets which issue he's talking about. So he will sometimes talk to Martin Luther King and forget that he's not talking to George Wallace. There's actually a very, uh, there's some funny moments where that happens. Or he'll be on with George Bundy as NSC advisor and start talking about civil rights issues, and George Bundy will wonder why that's the issue they're talking about at the day. He, he, you're beginning to see the overload of the president. No president before Lyndon Johnson worked as hard as he did. He worked probably 20 hours a day. He took uh, 200 pages on average or so to bed each night as nighttime reading of memos. No president worked harder. No president was more overwhelmed. No president got into more trouble as a consequence of that. He did more for civil rights than any other president before him, but he also brought us Vietnam and many crises uh, that, quite frankly, we've never worked uh, our way out of. Uh, this is all your lives as well. You're not presidents of the United States. Uh, but you're dealing with a barrage of issues. It would be easy if you could go back to this world, but you can't, you can't. And any leadership advice that pretends you're in that world uh, is not gonna be helpful to you. And as you rise in your organizations, uh, you're gonna have less and less time. That's the irony. The more power you have, the more your time is owned by other people, the more your time is owned by other people. So this image of George Washington which I think, I can't prove this, but I think is still the dominant image of leadership that Americans carry. Um, this image of this man of merit who comes from the people but rises above us, a man of virtue. That's the most common word used by the founders for leadership, by the way, virtue. A man of virtue, a man of competence, a man who is disinterested and humble, a man who doesn't lie. Um, all these elements of what made George Washington himself, what he is, uh, this sort of paternal figure, I think that's still the image we have um, of leadership. It's still on our money, uh, but it's not the reality. We're never gonna go back to that and we have to stop trying to be that. Uh, yet we seem to try. In fact, we, people run for president and campaign to be CEOs and things like that claiming they're gonna be figures like this. It's not gonna happen. We're not gonna look the same. We're not gonna do the same things. The world we live in is very different. So my research and the research of others that I draw on uh, points to a lot of things that we have to talk about. I'm gonna to point to five today because they're things I've done work on in particular, um, but they're also things I think that are really important and fun to talk to, and perhaps they work in this kind of presentation. Um, uh, five things leaders have to do. Uh, and none of these involve just being smarter. None of these involve uh, just working harder. In fact, some of them were involved working less hard, in fact. Uh, the point here is that these five things are not about simply putting in more hours and answering more email. Doing more of that will actually not make you a better leader, or not necessarily at least make you a better leader. Five things I think leaders need to do in the environment that I've just tried to paint, that we all operate in one way or another, and I'm gonna talk briefly about each of these. Please follow up with me on questions. Uh, I've written a lot about these in, in my book and articles. You can certainly find them elsewhere. Uh, and I'm also interested in your feedback on this. Uh, and they, they go in order of importance. They're all important, but five is even more important than one. But you've got to do one to get to five. Uh, you've got to paint the picture. The world is so complex, and I'm going to talk about this, um, that people have to know why they're doing what they're doing, and they often don't know why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, this is a little game I play uh, when I'm on airplanes, which I'm on far too often. Uh, my wife's always criticizing me for traveling too much. Uh, when I'm on airplanes, um, people often try to talk to me, and I'm trying to work, and I get really upset that they're talking to me because I want to get my work done. Uh, so what I do is I ask them what they do, and uh, it's amazing how hard it is for some people to answer why they do what they do and how they do what they do because they don't have a bigger picture of what it is. Leaders have to paint a picture for everyone in their organization or everyone who they touch. 
in one way or another as, as leaders. They have to define a purpose. They have to define a purpose. They have to pursue priorities. They have to teach history and they have to eliminate distractions. I already talked a little bit about that. These seem very obvious. My research and the research of others shows that most leaders do very little of these five things, not because uh, they don't know it's important and not because they don't want to do it, but because they're too busy doing other things. Uh, these are the most important things to do, or these are among the most important things to do. And we need to talk about how we do these in the world that we live in. So let's start with painting a picture. I have a picture for you. I just want to give you all a second to look at this. I hope you've all seen this before. Um, this is the famous Earthrise photo uh, taken by Apollo 8 on Christmas Eve, 1968. It's about seven months uh, before uh, the moon landing, which is July of 69, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, and this is perhaps one of the most influential photos uh, ever taken. Uh, you, some of you might remember it, uh, some of you have read about it. Um, this photo changed the way human beings saw themselves in the world. This photo is considered by environmental historians one of the most important environmental photos. It's considered by uh, social activists, uh, and those who study social activists, an incredibly important photo in capturing the interdependence of all of us. The world is fragile. The world is small. The world is there and we have a fiduciary responsibility to take care of it. That's sort of what the message seems to be in this. It resituates where we are. We might be struggling in our city or in our business or in our family, but we see ourselves now as part of something more timeless, more universal, more fragile, something we need to take care of more, something that's beautiful, light, and precarious, something that won't necessarily last uh, forever. This image changed the picture thousands and thousands of young people who I've studied had of the world. Many people uh, who I've studied did not become environmentalists or social activists simply because they believed in uh, trees and they believed in civil rights. Uh, they became social activists because they saw the world differently from their parents. They pictured their place in it differently. And leaders like Gaylord Nelson who created uh, Earth Day uh, and social activists, gay and lesbian activists, uh, economic and anti-poverty activists use this image and use this picture to resituate where people were and how they thought about their lives. Not everyone was persuaded by this, but it, it, it really changed. Uh, the historical research is pretty clear. It really changed the way people saw themselves in the world. And leaders use that image. To say you have to paint a picture is not to say you need to be Picasso. Uh, it is to say you need to find an image that situates the people you work with in a way that focuses them on the things that you think matter and helps them understand their place in something larger. Back to my airplane uh, story, most people I sit next to in airplanes can tell you what they do day to day, but they can't tell you why they do it and why it's important. They don't have a larger picture. Uh, uh, most professors at universities know what they teach, but they don't have a larger picture of what the educational mission is. Leaders give people a larger picture. Leaders give people a larger picture that's radical, that push pulls them out of where they are and gives them a sense of where they're going. If you don't do this, you are not leading. I wanna say that again. If you don't do this, you are not leading. And you don't have to be the president to do this. You can do this in your small office. You can do this on your team. That's what a good coach does. I'll come back to that point later. That's what a good parent does. That's what a good community leader does. Gives the people she or he work with a sense of something larger than themselves. And we know from the research, this doesn't come in an email. It doesn't come when you're multitasking. It comes from deep thinking, time, and it comes from synthesis, from seeing other things, spending the time. It, it is an aesthetic experience. I really want to emphasize that. If I forget nothing, if, if, you, for, if, I forget, if, if you forget everything I say, please don't forget this. Uh, leadership is an aesthetic experience. People who have been around great leaders, and we all have at one time in our lives, it wasn't just that we were led by our brains. We felt something different. We felt there's a chemical, emotional connection. Uh, many people 
uh, in a sense, fall in love with their leaders, not love in a romantic or physical sense, love in an emotional sense. You have to feel connected. You have to feel part of some larger picture and you have to offer that opportunity for the people you work with. You have to build that, you have to draw that, you have to make them see that around them. Another example of this is, and this image did not come out as well as I hoped it did, uh, this is uh, what Mayor Bloomberg did in New York City. And I'm not an expert on Mayor Bloomberg. I grew up in New York, uh, but I'm not an expert on Mayor Bloomberg. I'm not here to espouse or criticize Mayor Bloomberg. I am to say that he kind of got this. He understood how to do what I'm just saying. Uh, I grew up in New York City in the late 70s and early 80s. It was a dirty, grimy, crime-ridden city. It was not a pleasant place to live. Mayor Bloomberg became mayor, and no matter what you want to say about him, one thing he did is he helped the mayor, helped New Yorkers re-envision their city. And he used old images like this all over his website, all over his campaign materials of a city from a different time, from the 1930s. It was the Depression. But in memory, the United States and New York City was the leader of the world. The Empire State Building was showing that this was the most modern city moving forward. And the images he showed were a city that was prosperous, a city that was growing, and a city that did not have bad things happening within it. He got New Yorkers to imagine a different kind of city, and he used that to leverage the redesign of the city, investing in things uh, like a new West Side Highway walkway, the Skyway there, closing Broadway, uh, changing the way the city operates, charging people to drive into the city to discourage excessive driving, all sorts of things like that. Again, I don't wanna talk about his policies. I wanna say that his popularity, his ability to lead was actually because he gave New Yorkers a different vision of their city, a different picture of what their city could be and what it had been and what it should be. And that's what leaders do. We call this vision sometimes. I want to call it a picture because uh, vision can sound prescriptive and didactic. People don't follow someone because they wag their finger or even because they have eloquent words alone. They follow them because they can see themselves as part of something larger than themselves. So that's the emotional aesthetic part of this. You must help the people you work with to see themselves and feel as if they're larger, part of something larger than themselves. I spent a lot of time in my research and teaching on this. Um, there's a lot more to say. I could go on for like six hours about this right now and that would completely bore you to death. Uh, but this is something we, we, we all can talk more about, I hope, and follow up on. I, I want you at least to start thinking of, about them right now. Okay, second on our list is purpose, defining a purpose. Uh, defining a purpose comes after you have a picture of what it is you're doing. Then when you, when, you, when you know who you are, what you're part of, what the team is, what is the team about? What does success look like? What is a purpose? And a purpose is usually not something negative. It has to be something positive, something that moves people. This is one of my favorite photos. I've already showed the Earthrise photos, another one of my favorite photos. This is Abraham Lincoln, there he is in the center. Uh, giving the second inaugural address, uh, one of the truly great speeches, not just in U.S. history and world history. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had two years of education, less than all of us, uh, but yet uh, he produced some of the finest English language. Not only does he have two of the five best speeches in American history, uh, his speeches are works of art, uh, works of literature, and they define a purpose. Uh, think how often you've heard people cite of the people, by the people, for the people. That's the definition of democracy. That's from Lincoln. That's from Lincoln. Finding in politics the better angels of our nature. That's also from Lincoln. And the second inaugural address has these words. I generally don't like to put up words on a slide, um, violating my own rule because these words are so important. And they are the best example I can find of someone defining a purpose for a divided, suffering nation that doesn't know what to do. A divided, suffering nation that doesn't know where to go. Uh, this is March of 1865. I'm gonna read these words to you because again, this is aesthetic, right? Leadership is aesthetic, it's kinetic. You need to feel it, not just read it. So I'm gonna to try to read it without Lincoln's uh, Kentucky accent because uh, I, don't, I don't like Kentucky accents. Um, okay, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. In these two paragraphs, which are part of a very short inaugural address, this is about a, a third of it, maybe 40% of it. And side note, short, clear writing is better than long, unreadable writing. You don't move people by the proliferation of words, you move people by the quality of your words. Uh, 150 years later, those words still sing out to us. They define the American purpose in war and in peace. Lincoln makes it clear that the war was about slavery. He makes it clear in these last days of the war that the war is not about victory for one side or another, that slavery was a cancer that all parts of American society, like racism, were part of and were complicit in, and that the war is about extracting that cancer and building a better nation. There's no claim of victory. There's no claim of one side is wrong, one side is right. Uh, but there's no apology for misdeeds either. There is an artful description, a moving emotional connection about a world to be built, that is to be a better nation, a nation where people work together and cherish one another and a nation of free men and free women. Uh, defining that purpose in these eloquent terms is not about wagging his finger it's about taking the picture of a common America, that was point number one from before, and now connecting it to point number two, not just a picture now, an actual program, an actual purpose of building this better nation. That, by the way, is Republican Party platform, Republican Party program for the next 50 years. There's no Theodore Roosevelt, there's no progressivism in the United States if there isn't this Lincolnian message. That becomes the purpose of that party for the next 50 years. Lincoln's the first Republican president. And Theodore Roosevelt will then be the really next great Republican president following exactly on, on this purpose. You define a purpose by providing the language, the words that take the picture you have formed and connecting the people around you and giving it placement, giving it motion, giving it a place to go, a direction, a sense of what it is about. And people have to feel that just as they have to feel they're part of the team, just as they have to feel they're part of the picture. This is all obviously easier, um, easier said than done. Okay, let's just quickly go back. We've talked about picture and purpose. Now let's talk about priorities. We're running through like a whole year's worth of work here uh, very quickly. Uh, priorities. Once you have your picture, you have your team. Once you have your sense of what you're about, whether it's your small office or it's your city or it's your legislature or it's your business, you've got your picture, you've got your purpose. Now you've got to set priorities. And I've got another cartoon, of course. I love this cartoon. I use this cartoon with undergraduates to explain what the New Deal was. Uh, and I'll begin by saying uh, that large jar on the table there that says NRA is not the National Rifle Association. It is the National Recovery Act. The National Recovery Act. And if you don't know what the National Recovery Act is, which you might not, uh, please send me the name of your high school history teacher because I want to yell at them for not teaching you this. Uh, every American should know the story, regardless of where you grew up and regardless of what you do. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, there depicted as the medicine man. He's making house calls. Uh, this doesn't work with undergrads. They cannot imagine a doctor making house calls. They're curious as to why he's not asking for an insurance card or something. Um, Franklin Roosevelt is coming as the medicine man, uh, and he's coming to help cure the sick Uncle Sam. And uh, notice Congress there. This is a cartoon, ladies and gentlemen, from 1936. Some things never change, right? Look at Congress there. Uh, you know, you could look at that and think, wow, is that Mitch McConnell or Chuck Schumer? Or who is that uh, right there next to uh, Roosevelt? Um, he's coming, and uh, the medicine man is, is not always someone to trust, right? He's peddling his elixirs. Look at the table there. Uh, those are his elixirs. Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Civilian Works Administration, National Recovery Act. Uh, these are all New Deal agencies, government agencies, plans, programs that Roosevelt creates or that those around him create, part of his brain trust, that governors create to try to deal with the hemorrhaging of jobs, the hemorrhaging of homes, and quite frankly, the starvation of Americans. In 1936, older Americans 
were dying of malnutrition. That is so hard for us to, con to conceptualize today. Uh, in 1936, the poorest Americans most likely to starve were the old. Uh, today, that's the young. In fact, one of the successes of the New Deal is to flip that uh, through Social Security, through Medicare. Uh, we've come to a point now where the elder Americans have better uh, living conditions, and they deserve it, than younger Americans. Uh, it was the opposite uh, at that time. So this would have resonated with an audience in 1936. Uh, what this captures is not democracy, nor great leadership, it captures priorities. Roosevelt makes it clear, and this is what the New Deal is all about, that what matters most, what matters most, he says this is in his, in his inaugural, and he carries it forward in everything he does in every meeting. I've spent years reading his papers. It comes forth everywhere. Everything that is going to be done must be done to provide food, shelter, and jobs to Americans, full stop. Food, shelter, and jobs. As he says at one point, Roosevelt does, I do one thing with my left hand, I do one thing with my right hand. And if something works to put people to work and give them food and shelter, I keep doing it. If it doesn't, I stop doing it. Everything was about that. Roosevelt ran for office on a promise to balance the budget, which he took seriously. But that became a less important priority. He was concerned about the rise of fascism. But he waited a long time to address that problem because this was the priority. He conveyed that to everyone who worked with him, everyone who talked to him. His priority was not even democratic politics. His priority was food, shelter, jobs. Food, shelter, jobs. That sounds so simple to do. But in my research, very few leaders do that. Leaders hedge. Leaders are afraid to set priorities. They don't know what their priorities should be because problems are very complex and they get lost in the complexity and forget the basic priorities. You must, in whatever leadership role you have, ask yourself what's most important. You must put above your screen, on your arm, right on your hand, as my children do, what those priorities are and make sure everything you say every day to every person you work with conveys those priorities. If you are not conveying your priorities, you are not leading. You can have a team that has a picture and you can have a purpose, but if people don't know what the priorities are to get there, you have become the Holy Roman Empire, neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. And most organizations operate that way. We suffer as a society from organizational mediocrity because we are doing lots of things we don't set priorities. This is true of universities, this is true of our state government, it's true of our federal government, it's true of our city government, it's true of our police services, it's true of everything in our society. Uh, we are afraid to set priorities. Once we set priorities, we set ourselves up finally for higher achievement. And, and that is what Franklin Roosevelt does. That's what the New Deal is. That is the shining achievement of Franklin Roosevelt. And it's about having the insight and the will and the recognition of how important it is to have priorities. Okay, that's again another long, long set of classes and discussions, and there's a lot of research attached to that. Fourth, uh, teaching history. Uh, you'll be very surprised that I talk about the importance of teaching history. Uh, strangely, I work that into everything I do. Um, here we have one of my favorite authors. I know you're all familiar with her, Toni Morrison. She just passed away. And the African American History Museum in Washington, D.C. that recently opened. I hope you've all visited. If you haven't, I encourage you to go visit. It doesn't matter whether you're interested in that history or not. It's worth seeing. Um, here's what my research in particular, this is something I've spent a lot of time doing research on and written a lot about. Um, understanding the history of what you are doing is enormously powerful and usually underrated by people. This is actually Toni Morrison's point in her novels, Beloved and the Blue Eye and various others, that actually knowing where you have come from allows you to root your work in something more than the immediacy of the moment. It becomes a salvation. The problem is that you can get so caught up in the arguments of the moment that you forget why you're in the place you're in. And you're not just in that place because you have a purpose and priorities. You're in that place because of a history. Austin looks the way it does because of a history. That history is about the tech boom. That history is about the founding of the university. That history is about the 1928 segregated city plans. But all these things, good and bad, racial, economic, technological. And to understand that history roots you. And leaders who understand who have a sensibility of that history, they find it much easier to do everything else I've talked about. And my research shows that leaders who don't have a sense of history, 
easily fall into many, many mistakes because they lose a sense of where they're rooted. Uh, this is, we've all experienced this. Someone who's very smart, but, but doesn't have a sense of the organization, they come in and they make a lot of mistakes. It's important to have outsider knowledge, but you have to develop an anthropological sense of what you're working on. This is so enormously powerful. What I've tried to show in a lot of my research is that actually you can see this in leaders. Uh, two ways you see this. First of all, do they go beyond simple analogies when they're talking about issues? Every foreign enemy is not Hitler. Every problem is not the same as one example that we all know. Do they have a broader range of understanding? Do they look at a city like Austin or a state like Texas or a country like the United States and have a broader repertoire of understanding how the moment they're in relates to things? And second, do they have a sense also of unintended consequences? Do they see the humility of their position? You see, we can all get drunk on power and stressed out, and we push that the, the stress makes us more uh, immodest, it makes us push harder, and we lose a sense of perspective. Having a perspective, this is what Tony Morrison's work is all about, having a perspective on race, for example, in the United States, gives you a sensibility when you're talking about issues like transportation, when you're talking about issues like planning, when you're talking about issues like military mobilization. It gives you a sense of the broader range of effects of these issues. It gives you the instincts to ask the right questions. Uh, I do a whole course on Machiavelli in history. Machiavelli's great insight is that the prince, he says, will not be a better prince because he surrounds himself with smart people. The prince will be a better prince because he knows the questions to ask. You don't know the questions to ask if you don't know the history. Uh, and again, I could spend a lot more time that research is overwhelming on that point, and it's my research, so I, I believe it. Okay, uh, final point. Avoiding, I put eliminating distractions. Eliminating distractions. It's not just time, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just email. It's how distractions can be convenient. And now I am going to say something politically controversial, uh, but I think it's research-based and I hope you'll go along with me. Um, shooting in El Paso, um, just uh, a little more than a week ago. Uh, I am not an expert on uh, mass shootings and guns. I don't have the answers, but I do know it is a convenient distraction to talk about everything other than the fact that mass shootings occur in large part, overwhelmingly, when white men have guns. If you talk about anything else, and that alone, you're talking about the distractions, not the real issue. What to do about it, I don't know. I'm not an expert. I don't have the policy solution. But if you wanna talk about this issue as a leader, as a public leader, as a private leader, as a journalist, whatever, and you don't talk about that, the fact that in the United States, there are more individuals with guns who come from the United States, predominantly male, and that they do this. The guns and the presence of who is holding those guns is the issue. It might not be the solution, but it is the issue, ladies and gentlemen. And any discussion of video games, mental health, or other things that might still matter is a distraction when it is not connected to the individual carrying the gun. That is what this is about. And we would all say that if we were talking about a terrorist coming from another society. Somehow we have allowed ourselves. It's not just that we're busy. It's not just that we have lots of emails to answer. It is convenient to talk about other things. That's fine. That's not leadership. Leadership is talking about what matters. We eliminate distractions by having the courage and the integrity to talk about what matters rather than what we just think we can talk about. And leaders have to find a way to do that. If you don't, you are not leading. And boy, oh boy, is this where we're failing. And I'm not trying to condemn one side or the other, and I'm not pr promoting a particular solution. I'm just doing my job saying, the historian, the scholar of leadership says, uh, we're not talking about the issue, and therefore we're not leading on this. And, and we could carry this to many other examples, many other things in our society, if we're talking about healthcare, if we're talking about crime, if we're talking uh, about inequality, whatever it is, whatever your politics are, you can disagree on what the interpretive solution should be. But please, if you wanna lead, talk about the real issue. Don't find the convenient distractions and don't allow those around you. What I found in my research is that when you have a controversial issue like this, 
staff, the people who work for you, will try to get you to focus on distractions. Your donors or your board will try to get you to focus on distractions because they bring their own programs. They bring their own interests. You as a leader have to rise above that and be willing to talk about what matters most. Back to Franklin Roosevelt. He wanted to talk about and knew the issue was jobs, shelter, and food. It wasn't about economic philosophy, just as the issue of shooting, right, is really not about the Second Amendment. It's about people carrying guns and shooting people with those guns, right? That's what has to be talked about. Okay, now that I've alienated half my audience, um, here we have, uh, as my effort to lead, uh, here we have an example, a recent example, of a group that did everything I said. And I never, I haven't had a chance to talk to them. I wish I had. I wish I could claim credit. Uh, they didn't need me. Uh, they did all this. I'm serious. Uh, these uh, ladies on the uh, US uh, Women's World Cup team that won the championship, I don't know if they're the greatest athletes. I'm not an expert on soccer. Uh, my daughter, who's an athlete, tells me they are just amazing athletes. They were fun to watch. But they did all the things um, I talked about. Uh, they created a picture, looking at it, a different picture for a very divided society of uh, what we could be, what we could be. And, and, and talk to my daughter and other young women who uh, were watching this. Another picture of what athletics could be. They had a purpose. They had a purpose. And it wasn't just winning, by the way. Right? They had a purpose about promoting and making women's soccer into something that it hadn't been before. They had priorities. Boy, did they have distractions. You all know that. They had priorities. It's amazing to me that they were able to stay so focused uh, with all the distractions. They understood the history. They understood the history of how women's soccer had been viewed, about unequal pay, about all kinds of issues. They understood that history. They carried that with them. They talked about it. They showed that they were rooted in that. They addressed that, but they didn't address it in a way that alienated people either. And they avoided distractions. I mean, I, I, I was betting that they weren't going to win just because of all the other stuff around them, all the distractions. We've seen this. The best athletes, just like the smartest people in the room, often don't produce the best outcomes because they get distracted. Uh, smart people are easy to distract. Great athletes are easy to distract. Uh, they avoided all that. Uh, they did this. They did this. Um, and, and I do think it's what we're talking about here. We have to all figure out how we do that. If you're an effective leader, you've got a team that looks like this. And I, I'm, I mean that in every, every possible way. Um, we can all be a part of this one way. I try to do this, and I put this up not just to promote my podcast. This is the, the weekly podcast I do at the university. Um, I, we have all kinds of guests on. My son is also on it as our poet. Uh, I'm not putting this up, though, just to promote that, though I do hope you'll all listen to our podcast. Uh, it, it's my effort to try to get beyond the classroom and get beyond the public lectures I give and the writing to start a conversation about this. I don't know if this works. Uh, we have a lot of listeners, but I don't know if it really influences them. But we all, got to, we all have to try. We all have to try. And whatever we think is our domain of work. To have a conversation. A conversation about, back to where I started, about the picture we want for the organization and the world we care about. Our purpose. What our priorities will be. How this will fit with our history. And how we're going to eliminate the distractions that seem to make us less than what we can be. Leadership is aesthetic and it is dialogical. It's aesthetic and it's dialogical. That's what my research really focuses on. It's about getting people to feel connected and feel these things and getting people to be part of a conversation. You are not leader because you have all the right answers or you're the smartest in the room or you're the strongest. You're a leader because you are bringing people together, giving them a picture of purpose, priorities, connecting them to their history and helping them to eliminate distractions. Uh, I'll, I'll close on, on a point that, in, in a way, all the research and everything I do, uh, it, it's not new. This is what has worked over time in various different kinds of societies. It's done differently in different places. It always looks different in different contexts by different people. But it's not new. It's not new. Sometimes we have to remember what we've done before to do better as we go forward. All right, I will stop for now uh, and take questions for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Thank you all for listening. And I'll leave this, this list up here. Oops. 
I'm not seeing any questions yet, but maybe I'm not looking in the right place. Lewis, am I, Miles, am I looking in the right place? And I'm just, why am I flipping through this here? I'll go back to this. Pardon me for distracting you. Uh, that's what I want to be in. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So I've got a question from uh, Lewis, actually. Okay. Wow. Uh, he's been setting me up here. Early on, Lewis asked, you mentioned the paralysis that fear of failure creates. Uh, I've seen a lot of articles saying that leaders encourage their team to take risks and embrace failure. Do you know of any leaders or organizations that actually embrace that idea right, of taking risks? Uh, can I give examples of risk taking uh, or organizations? Uh, there aren't that many. That's a problem. And so Lewis's uh, question is, is spot on in that there aren't that many, uh, but there are some uh, that do that. One of the most important ones uh, would be a research university that's doing its job as a research university. HDO, the creation of HDO, I'm gonna turn this back on you, Lewis. Creation of HDO was a risk for the university. Um, the creation of this kind of program. Uh, it's not accredited in the way most programs are. It doesn't show up in the kind of rankings of universities. So uh, this was a risk. Universities in their best moments take risks. Uh, some city governments do, some state governments uh, do. I think Mayor Bloomberg took a lot of risks in rethinking what a city like New York should look like. Um, but it doesn't happen in general. I guess that's the point, Lewis. Okay, uh, Lindsay, how do you recommend setting priorities as mid-level management when you don't have clear direction from those above you? Great question, Lindsay. This is part of managing up. And I think one of the ways you do this, one of the ways you set priorities is you don't begin by saying, okay, let's have priorities. You work on numbers one and two first. You create a picture of what your organization is and you work on what the purpose is. And that I've seen can filter up. Uh, a good department is persuading its, uh, those above it and telling them what it does and what it does well. And that helps them to define priorities. Too often we go to those above us and demand attention to priorities before we've created the picture and the purpose. So one way to do this is to create, this is grassroots activism. Create on the ground in your organization the picture and the purpose, and that will attract, in some cases, those at the top. It won't always, uh, but that's way to, one way to do it. Okay, I hope I'm not missing these as they come through fast. Now that first we didn't have any questions, now we get lots of them. Any tricks for eliminating distractions for leaders of remote teams whose main way to be connected to their teams can be to stay on a platform? Uh, Slack, in my case, uh, in, in the example there. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with that. I have talked to groups about that. I think um, it's really important that even when you're uh, in remote activities, you find some way to bring everyone together. I'm a deep believer, even if it can't be face-to-face, -face, that simultaneity matters. And so finding more simultaneous moments. I don't think we can work as a team when we're not working at the same time, at least some of the time. Uh, Matt says, many wonderful leaders are good listeners. How does this fold into your main ideas? Absolutely. Uh, part of the way uh, you create a picture and a purpose and set priorities and learn history is in communication with people. You have to listen. You are not, back to Machiavelli, the person with all the answers. You are the person with the questions. The questions that structure the answers. You are a questioner as a leader more than a dictator. Uh, and we all learn this as parents too. Somehow we seem to forget it when we go to the office. Uh, um, Margaret, on the subject of failure, Edward Burke, Edward Burke's a great scholar, uh, preaches the necessity of failing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Ed is absolutely right on that. You can't succeed unless you fail first. Uh, we know this from sports. We know this in all kinds of areas. Every successful leader I've studied failed more than they succeeded. We need to create a picture and a purpose to explain to people why it's okay to fail. Why it's not just about the individual thing we do. Um, uh, Cab 366 uh, says, I, I help leaders increase their ability to reduce. Can you speak to lifestyle behaviors? Ah, great question. Um, I'm a deep believer uh, that when we talk about work-life balance, it's not simply having time away from work. It's having stimulating intellectual and aesthetic experiences away from work. If you take a lot of time off from work and you're just watching TV, I'm not sure you're enhancing yourself. You might be making yourself a worse person. Go back to work if you're just watching TV. Um, I think actually uh, the leaders I've studied and that the periods that produce the most creative leaders are when people are leaving their quote unquote work environment and they're surrounded by other stimulating things. Museums, theater, reading, interesting people. Uh, that's what draws us to places like Austin. We as human beings want to be around others who stimulate us when we're going out and having a drink or listening to music. So putting yourself in brain stimulating circumstances that are pleasurable 
but also enhancing your brain. Our brains, this is Art Markman's work too, right? Our brains have to keep growing otherwise. Otherwise they do uh, atrophy. Uh, Flores, uh, what, what are strategies work best when groups want to focus on distractions versus addressing real issues? Great question. The gun, the gun issue is a great example of that. There are reasons why people want to focus on game, on on games or on mental health and not on the big issue of people carrying guns. Uh, it is important to paint the picture of why that's important and tell the story. Don't let them tell that story. Don't let this become a story of mental health. It's not that mental health is irrelevant. The story has to be the story of white men in most cases carrying guns into schools. It frightens me to death that my kids are in schools that could be susceptible to this or into public places and shooting people up. That is the story. That's the picture we have to have in mind. We have to promote that before we're even promoting our solutions. People have to recognize what the issue is. We have to put the time into that. And everyone's not going to be happy. I'm sure not everyone's happy. I said it here, by the way. Uh, Antonio, returning to the five principles. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. When politics or beliefs are a common threat, how does your vision set apart from painting the picture? Right. So I think there are obviously things that divide us naturally in the kinds of pictures we associate with and the kinds of ways we see the world. Um, I think there often are more commonalities though. We tend to focus on the differences. And I think really focusing on the commonalities, not in a, in a superficial way, but finding the things that bring us together. Religion is one, it has traditionally brought Americans together to Tocqueville when he visited the United States in the 1830s. So Americans had so many different ways of worshiping, but he said they all believed in some way that through hard work, they would show that they were virtuous, moral, religious people. Uh, there are ways to get beyond the superficial differences. It takes a lot of work. That's, again, where that painting of picture is so important. Uh, but it's something we don't, don't spend the time to do. We instead just mobilize our own group. Um, Jim asks about uh, uh, experimenting. Um, so how, uh, what observations do you have on leaders experimenting in voluntary fear engagement, not only for themselves? For example, how would a leader paint a picture of a future where I, so, so in a sense, is the science fiction question that Jim is asking, right? Is there sometimes worth scaring people to get them to look at a picture? Maybe I did that when talking about guns. I, I think within limits, I think we can go much too far in that. Fear is debilitating. Uh, and again, a lot of the psycho psychology courses that are taught in HDO make this point very well. It's not really my research, but I think it's, I, I've seen it in my own research too. Right? Fear uh, makes people sort of uh, hunger down and closes off creativity. So it, it can be effective to jolt people, but you've got to make sure your message is not about fear. Your painting is not a horror picture. I cannot imagine being an effective leader with a horror picture. Uh, but that doesn't mean you might not give people a wake up call as one might around uh, global warming or, or, or something like that. So fear has to be used very carefully and within very, very careful limits because it can become very, uh, almost nuclear in its consequences. Okay, we are at uh, about one o'clock. Are there any questions I didn't get to? Um, Lewis is telling me I should let you all get, <laughs> get back to your work. Uh, hopefully you haven't seen this as, as a distraction. I really enjoyed this. I, oh, one, more, one more question came in, I will answer that one because Swati got it in before I started closing us off. With teams coming from different backgrounds and experience with the same job, how to talk about history with these teams. A great question, Swati. This is what I do every day as a history professor. My students come from all kinds of diverse backgrounds. It's worth noting, uh, obviously the semester hasn't started, but in the last semester, I had about 300 students or so. I had at least 10 dreamers. I had students from South Asia, from Mexico. This is what makes our society great this kind of diversity, and history actually can bring people together. When you teach history, not just about one group. Uh, I'm for rigorous history, but I'm for history that uh, shows the history of many different actors who are important. So if you're teaching American history today, as I do, you need to teach the history not just of the founding fathers, but of the Chinese laborers who built the railroads, and uh, the history of slavery, and the history of the Irish and Italian immigrants, and the Jewish immigrants. Uh, history actually can bring people together by showing how their particular experiences connect to a larger American experience. We could do the same thing within a university. We could do the same thing within a city. Uh, in my experience, I hope we'll talk about this more, Swati. In my experience, experience, diversity allows you through history to actually tell a more compelling story to more people. 
I will close it on that because we are out of time. Thank you so much. And I hope I'll see all of you at other events at UT or around Austin. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, after the session, you'll receive a um, follow-up email that'll have a recording of today's session as well as information regarding future webinars. Um, if you have any questions or suggestions for improvement, please respond to that email. Uh, your feedback is greatly appreciated. Uh, and thanks again and have a great day.